Morant with a running start. Elevate! Oh, oh, it does! Oh, oh my goodness! Oh. He's done. High game in overtime. Gasol will turn his heat. It's gone! It's Gasol top. Seven tenths remain. Only now with three. Count it! A 15 point lead for Memphis. And Blake Griffin gets into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took exception. Adams going long. Morant! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Morant! Insanity! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. Grizzlies win edition. My name is Keith Parrish. The Grizzlies finish out their four-game road trip with a 111-106 victory over the Portland Trail Blazers. They get a huge fourth quarter from Desmond Bain. Desmond Bain puts on a show with 20 fourth quarter points. The role players delivered had a nice bounce back after some subpar performances in Utah, and the Grizzlies withstand a furious fourth quarter rally to improve to five and three on the season. I was nervous about this game. I probably assigned too much importance to it. I half jokingly said, but it's honestly how I felt. Like this game, the result of this game swings how you feel about the start of the season. If you lose three straight after starting four and one, you're feeling pretty bad. If you're four and four, you're thinking, all right, we have a lot of serious problems that need help, that need to be fixed, despite how well John Moran and Desmond Bain have played in the year. If we lose, we're four and four. Um, It's kind of panic time. If you win, five and three is great. Winning half your road games is awesome. You've played six of your first eight games on the road, and you have a winning record. And with the specific circumstances the Grizzlies have gone through, no Jaron Jackson Jr., then you find out before the season, no Zaire Williams, then you find out before the season, Dylan Brooks is going to miss several games, Desmond Bain's going to miss a game. Five and three is a great start. I said it in the preseason episode. I hope for five and three after eight games. That's what we got. The Grizzlies are three and oh this year. When they have their preferred starting lineup, that's the preferred starting lineup not having Jaron Jackson Jr. available. When Ja, when Dez, when Dylan, when Steven Adams play, they're 3-0. and This road win against the Trailblazers, the road win against the Kings, the home win against the Nets. That part's really good. Also good about this specific game against the Trailblazers, the defense showed up. Not to say they didn't have problems, but holding their opponent to 106 points, that is winning basketball. That's the best defense performance as far as points allowed this season. The first three quarters, the Trailblazers scored under 30 in each of them. The Grizzlies hadn't strung together that many quarters of sub-30 points from their opponents this season. The Grizzlies shared the basketball and they made shots. Now, if you want to look at the glass half empty, this game was too close. It didn't need to be this close. The Grizzlies made 13 of 28 three-pointers. 13 of 28 three-pointers. That's not the attempts. That's not the volume of three-pointers maybe that they're hoping for. But you make 13 of them. That's an excellent percentage. That is a high number for the Grizzlies. You should win. The Grizzlies got 28 assists. That's a direct response or a direct correlation between three-pointers going in, you end up with more assists, but the ball was moving. Steven Adams was getting those assists from the high post, those back door cuts. He was hitting with the bounce passes. Morant was finding guys for lobs. There could have been more lobs. Brandon Clark dropped a couple. Maybe one was easy, one was hard, but we kind of expect Brandon Clark to make those athletic plays. Last season when the Grizzlies got 28 or more assists, they were 28-1. and one. So you think 28 assists, 13 made three-pointers. 47% accuracy on your three-pointers. Should have won by a little bit more. The same issues arose in opponent second-chance scoring. The Grizzlies got demolished in second-chance points. 
The Trailblazers had more offensive rebounds. That continues to be an issue. But five and three, big picture. Love to see it. Desmond Bain finished with 29 points. 20 of those points, like I said, in the fourth quarter. He is the fifth Grizzlies player to score 20 or more points in a fourth quarter. When I tried to think of the other players before I looked it up, the only player I was sure in Grizzlies franchise history had had a 20-point fourth quarter was Troy Daniels. For whatever reason, that sticks in my mind. The other players that have a 20-point fourth quarter in franchise history, Dylan Brooks, his rookie year against Chicago, uh, Troy Daniels, Mike Miller did it twice, and then Sharif Abdul-Rahim back in the Vancouver days. So, a little novelty stat, Desmond Bain has done something John Morant's never done, which is score 20 points in a fourth quarter. Desmond Bain for the year averages 16.7 points, 3.6 rebounds, and 2.7 assists just in the second half. He's the fourth highest scorer in the NBA right now for second halves. He averages 16.7 points in the second halves. That is clearly boosted by that 30-point second half and now a 20-point or a 23-point second half in this one. The only players to have a higher second-half scoring average are Giannis Antetokounmpo, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, and Kevin Durant. One thing super interesting about this game is strategically, the coaching staff shortened the rotation. Desmond Bain returned after missing the last game with ankle soreness. Jake LaRavia was available after being out with illness. Steven Adams available. He had a sore jaw that popped up on the injury report. He left the second Utah game with that injury. The Grizzlies had their full complement of players, not counting Jaron and Zaire, and yet they played fewer players than they did in the previous game. The games against Utah, they did 10-man rotations. This game, maybe they understood how important it was. They listened to Grits and Grinds, and they were like, hey, this, this one game, basically as a referendum on our first eight games of the season. Clearly, they did not. But on the last game of this road trip, they said, let's get this victory. We're only going to play nine guys. No Xavier Tillman, healthy scratch, or a healthy did not play, coach's decision. Same thing. Jake LaRavia, DMP, coach's decision. They played David Roddy, who... Against Utah, most of his minutes were played with two other bigs on the court. He was playing the three. He played the four. I mean, it was either him or Conchar or Dylan Brooks. I'm not sure who the four is in those lineups, but they did all single big lineups with the second unit. Brandon Clark only played as a big, usually beside Roddy or Conchar as a power forward. So they played small. That's one of the reasons, likely, they got beat on the defensive glass. And they lost that offensive rebounding battle with the Trailblazers. They had trouble slowing down Yusuf Nurkic. Yusuf Nurkic had a huge game because the Grizzlies are small. I mean, Nurkic always plays well against the Grizzlies. He, I think, might be certified Grizz killer. But Nurkic had a big game, made a season high. I think a career high three three pointers. It was definitely a season high for Nurkic. But Roddy playing more of the four. I don't know if that resulted in a big bounce-back game, but Roddy made shots after missing all eight of his field goal attempts in the last game. Roddy made three three-pointers in this one, finishes with 10 points. That was encouraging to see. Conchar, who I believe was still secretly injured, Conchar made two out of four three-pointers. He scored 10 points, got five rebounds and four assists and a steal. Conchar seemed back. His previous two games, four points total. We needed this from John Conchar. I just think he got healthy. John Conchar gave you production off the bench. John Morant, haven't even talked about him until now. John Morant flirted with a triple-double, but basically this is an underwhelming game from, from John Morant. 20 points, nine rebounds, seven assists, but eight turnovers. It's the second most turnovers John Morant's ever had in a game. His career high is nine. 
He's done it twice, one of the nine turnover games, also at Portland. Ja did not make a three-pointer. It was only seven of 19 on his field goal attempts. He did continue his strong free throw shooting, six of seven from the line. As a team, they did much better from the foul line. It's nothing to write home about, 81.5%, but that'll get the job done. It's not disastrous. It's merely good. It's not excellent. It's just good. But Desmond Bain, 10 out of 11 from the line. You'd love to see the volume of free throws he got. John Morant, 6 for 7. As long as he's making 86% of his free throws, I'm going to be a very happy guy. Let's talk a little about Dylan Brooks, by the way. Dylan Brooks, you might say, quiet game. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that what the Dylan Brooks cricks wanted? Dylan Brooks, in the last three quarters, attempted three field goals. Dylan Brooks scored six points on three field goal attempts in the last three quarters. Only attempted seven field goals for the game. Dylan Brooks played nearly 30 minutes and attempted seven field goals. That's the dream, right? If Dylan's not cooking, just be a low usage wing defender. Mission accomplished. Unfurl the banner. I mean, did you guys notice? Dylan was not looking to score. He wasn't passing up shot opportunities. He's not going to pass up shot opportunities. But he was not the squeaky wheel. He was not shooting contested bad shots. I want to say he took two shots in the first minute. And they just really relaxed. Three out of seven from the field for nine points. Dylan's making 40% of his three-pointers this season. I don't know if it's a permanent change. I do think it is probably uh, an aberration. But we've seen now in multiple second halves, Dylan has the ability to get out of the way. He's not dumb. He sees John Morant getting towards the bucket. He lets him do it. He sees Desmond Bain making three-pointers. He's into that. He's not going to get in the way of Desmond Bain knocking down three-pointers. Dylan Brooks just being that role player that people want of him. By the way, in the last three seasons now, this was just the second game that Dylan Brooks has played 25 or more minutes and attempted eight or fewer field goals. So it might just be an aberration. Steven Adams had a big game in this one. Steven Adams with a second double-double. 14 points, 11 rebounds, 5 assists. 2 blocks. 2 made free throws. 2 out of 3 from the foul line. And he went to the glass uh, to bank one in. Wow. Steven Adams was aggressive early, looking to score. He finally got those assists. We hadn't seen the assist totals yet this season like we had in previous seasons. Some of that I assign to bad defensive decisions by the Portland Trailblazers schematically. They were guarding Grizzlies players too closely. They were opening themselves up to those back cuts. They were guarding Steven Adams too closely. What's he going to do, shoot it? But Steven Adams made a large impact on this game. 14 and 11, five assists, two blocks. Absolutely elite numbers. He played nearly 34 minutes because he was so effective. Sante Aldama, bounce back game from Sante. Sante had been bad in road games. His impact on the game had disappeared. His shooting numbers were terrible. A great bounce back game. This is the Jaron Jackson Jr. light box score that we want. 11 points, 7 rebounds, 3 of them on the offensive glass. 2 blocks and 2 made threes. Huge game from Santi. When Santi plays this well, he might be like the swing player for the Grizzlies. The most important player for their success outside of their main guys. We know what we're getting from John Morant. We know what we're getting from Desmond Bain. We generally know that Dylan Brooks is just, he's, he's going to give us something. Might be good, might be bad, but he's going to play hard, and he's a pretty good player. But if Santi plays well, 
maybe the Grizzlies win if Santi doesn't play well or if also the bench role players don't play well. It is much, much harder to get those victories. But Santi with a great bounce-back game. Brandon Clark, low-impact. Yes, he played a lot of his minutes as the lone big. He did play, and this was an adjustment, he did play some more minutes in this one with Santi Aldama. This might be a glimpse of the future of the second unit once Jaron Jackson Jr. comes back. I like the Brandon and Santi pairing. I think it's a tough ask for Brandon Clark and whoever your super small ball four is, if it's Dylan or Conchar or Roddy, it's really hard for those lineups to get stops. It's really hard for those lineups to get rebounds. The Clark fit with Tillman hasn't worked out historically. The Clark fit with Steven Adams is not what you prefer to do because of the complete lack of spacing from your front court. But theoretically, with Aldama, it should work a little bit better, and it did work in this game. So far this year... Not a ton of sample size because obviously we're just eight games into the year. But so far, they've played 105 possessions together. They're slightly positive, plus 4.8 net rating. But the important thing to me is the defensive rating. When Santi Aldama and Brandon Clark are on the court together so far this season, a defensive rating of 105.7, which is good. Which is much better than the Grizzlies' normal defensive rating. So maybe there is something there. There is a good future for the Brandon and Santi front court minutes together. Also, a follow-up to something I said last episode about how I thought Brandon Clark maybe should be more utilized with John Morant and less utilized with Tyus Jones. Well, again, small sample size, but this one game, Brandon's minutes with Ja were positive. Brandon's minutes with Tyus were negative. Now, there could just be the most simple explanation ever that Ja Morant is better than Tyus Jones. Sure, I grant you that one. That might explain it all. But so far this year, the Grizzlies have been outscored by 39 points in the 225 possessions Tyus and and Brandon Clark have played together. And then they've outscored their opponent by 14 points in just 55 possessions that Brandon Clark has played with Ja Morant. So, plus 25.5 net rating, Brandon and Ja. Minus 17.3 net rating, Brandon and Tyus. Also, adding to our data set in this game was negative Tyus and Ja minutes. When Tyus and Ja play together, which is probably, it's a necessity. It's a necessity based on Zaire Williams not being available. You would prefer to have your shooting guard minutes all played by Desmond Bain or Zaire or Dylan. That's ideal. And yeah, Contra can play there. But with those guys not available, you're seeing more and more, or they're utilizing more Tyus and Ja playing together. The updated numbers Minus 32.3 net rating. The big issue is a 146 defensive rating when Tyus Jones and John Morant are on the court together. That's according to Cleaning the Glass. They played 145 possessions. 146 defensive rating for the Tyus and John minutes. Not going awesome. But again, those minutes were great last year. Uh, They were terrible two years ago. Who knows where the correct answer is? Likely somewhere in between. Tyus, forgettable game. I mean, he had a career-high five turnovers against the Jazz last game. In this one, he's one for six with two points, five assists. No turnovers, though. But his floater was not going down. Basically, the only bench player to not have a pretty solid game. Although, Brandon Clark, whatever. But it's a good team win. You beat a Trailblazers team that was 5-1. and one. They were well-rested, playing a home game. Yes, they did not have Damian Lillard. And yet, the game could have gone better. The Grizzlies really had a chance, it felt like, to grow that lead in the third quarter, but they kept turning the basketball over. And then they got up 17 points in the fourth. When Bain started going off, Bain knocks down a couple three-pointers. He gets that assist to Conchar. A quick 9-0 run to start the fourth. You're cruising. You're up 17 with 9.5 to go. And then you don't score a field goal for the next six minutes. Anthony Simons starts going off. Uh, you make uh, you foul some three-point shooters. 
It wasn't the cleanest finish, but a win's a win, a road win's a win, and you performed down the clutch. John Morant did what he needed to do. You knocked down your free throws. You get out of there with a victory. I mean, look at the schedule, like we said, before the season. Five and three is good, but also the opponents don't seem that hard. Maybe Utah ended up being tougher than we assumed they were going to be. But if you win half your road games in the NBA, that's what they say. Like good teams, you you know, you want to you want to win 75% of your home games, win half your road games. That's how you get to 50 wins. So far, so good. The Grizzlies are 2-0 and at home, 3-3 three and three on the road. And now they have a three-game homestand coming up. They play three games in four days. They play the Hornets on Friday night. Get your tickets now by calling 901 888 hoop or visiting grizzlies.com. You play the Hornets, you play the Wizards, and then you have to face the Boston Celtics on Monday. That's a big game. The Celtics are very, very good. The only very, very good team or the only basically team where positive is going to be good this year that Grizzlies have played are the Mavericks. And we all know what happened in the Mavericks game. And the Hornets and Wizards are not pushovers. The Wizards are playing tough right now. 500 ball. The Hornets, they're 3-5, and five, but they beat the Warriors a few games ago. These are not pushovers, but these are home games you need to win. You should win. You're going to be favored. And definitely in two out of the three, if everybody's healthy, you're probably going to be favored against the Celtics if everybody's healthy. You want to go 2-1? and 3-0 and oh would be absolutely ideal, of course. Anyways, I might as well tell you Desmond Bain's averages for the year just luxuriate in them while they're so unbelievable. I told you he was second half numbers. Currently this season, Desmond Bain is averaging 24.9 points per game, five assists per game, and 5.1 rebounds. Almost 25, five and five for Desmond Bain. Making 47% of his three-pointers. 87% from the line. Shameful. Get that up to 90%, Desmond Bain. Another thing to watch out for. All right, we've monitored that the the three-pointer heals all. The Grizzlies got crushed on the offensive glass again. They're not generating steals and blocks and turnovers and such. Although the Portland Trailblazers turned the ball over a ton this game, so that's not fair to say. There were a ton of turnovers forced by the Grizzlies this game. That helped the Grizzlies win. But the three-point shooting... The question is going to be, can it maintain at the current accuracy levels? Bain, yes. Proof of concept. He can keep making these three-pointers. 47% is pretty high. It's higher than last year when he was second in the NBA. But Ja, who only took two in this one and missed them both, Ja is still 52% on the year. That's coming down. Dylan Brooks is 41% on the year. That's coming down. Tyus Jones at 37, that's what he shoots. So hopefully that'll maintain. Aldama, 29% now on the season. We, we have no idea. We have no idea. Conchar, 40%. That's his career number. Hopefully he can keep that going. LaRavia, he's taken 15 of them. He's made nine, so he's 60%. Nine out of 15, perfect. But clearly that number's coming down. Um, can they maintain the three-point shooting? I don't see a lot of guys where there's clear areas of improvement. David Roddy now after this game making three out of six up to 22, 23% for the season. Assume Roddy's going to get closer to 30, maybe to 30, all the way to 35. Um, the three-point shooting might level out for the Grizzlies. It might actually go down. Then, of course, hopefully, Zaire and Jaron will be back to bolster this team when needed because they still have those bench issues. As much as we say winning this game makes you feel really great about the season, which it does, it does not fix the issues that are going to get the Grizzlies into the third round of the playoffs or even out of the first round of the playoffs. They still need um, to be better in a lot of areas, but they started slow on defense last year. Maybe it's just their thing. Maybe they have to have their backs against the wall before they really start digging in and defending. But this game against the Trailblazers was a good first step. Very nice defensive performance. Good team win. And now... Let's play some home games and win some basketball. Anyways, thank you guys for listening to this episode. Please subscribe to the Grits and Grinds YouTube channel if you haven't already. Give me a five-star review in whatever podcast app you are listening to this in. Hope you have a great Thursday. Talk to you soon. Go Grizz.